Hey, Foot Clan, we got a great show for you today. Getting into the truth of the running back position. How consistent were these guys? Did they make a difference? Were they worthy of those top end draft picks in your draft? We dig into all of that today. Don't miss a minute. Make sure you like, subscribe, leave a comment. Hey, this is Austin Eckler, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Thursday, January 26th, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Jason Moore is here. I am. We have a large cardboard (gasps) imitation of Mike, the Fantasy Hitman. We do. A stand-in. I'm Andy Holloway. Welcome into the show. We're talking truth. Mm Mm-hmm. The running back position, starting to go through those players today. There's no fluff here, and some of the truth isn't uh, isn't very kind. Okay. Yeah, you excited to talk about it? Yeah, there's a couple players specifically that I think uh, diving a little deeper on might reveal some things. Um, and we'll look at overall trends of the running back position as well, uh, what we're seeing in fantasy football. These episodes will key you in on to the, the real difference that some of these draft picks made for your roster or the difference they didn't make uh, compared to expectations. So uh, stay tuned for that. You can find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you're into the, the, the TikTok, but we're over there. I hear we're over there. Yeah, I'll I, be honest. Yeah, well, I mean, we... we they we, don't let me in. Well, they put you there, Uh huh. but you don't put you there. Right. Other people that are younger put We're, me there. That's that's the that's by law. Uh huh. You are not allowed to participate in the platform <laughs> directly. That's right. That's right. And then uh we're on Instagram. Where I, I am on Instagram. Instagram dot com slash fantasy footballers and YouTube dot com slash the fantasy footballers to watch the show. So let's uh let's start with a quick question. Are you prepared, Mr. Moore? I'm always prepared, Mr. Holloway. <laughs> This is going to be a good one. Uh, Dynasty, quick question from Peter in Rhode Island. Should I trade DK Metcalf for the 101 rookie pick? I have pretty good young wide receivers. I could use some help at the running back position. Obviously, I would be taking Bijan in that scenario. This is a Dynasty full PPR league. Uh, I will stay silent. I will let you reply, and then I will share my opinion. I am very curious your opinion. I think we might differ here. Um, I would be clearly on the side in this specific situation of the 101. I would rather have the 101 than DK Metcalf. And there's there's a philosophical argument here, which I am usually on the other side of, of the known proven commodity versus the uh, hopeful unproven upside but that has far more risk right there is no risk to having DK Metcalf the risk to having DK Metcalf is that he's just too big and strong and talented like we, we already know he's great we know he's going to be you know the last uh, couple of years of his career the wide receiver seven the wide receiver 12 those were both with Russell Wilson we thought it would go way down he was still the wide receiver 18 with Geno he was uh, dominant in his own right. So you know that DK Metcalf is a valuable fantasy asset. As much love and hope and hype as there is for Bijan Robinson, there is a world where he isn't good. Where Nikhil Harry, who was the 101 uh, dynasty rookie pick, just doesn't work out. All that being said, Bijan is different in the sense that You know, even that year with Nikhil Harry, um, the year with Bishop Sankey, we knew that those were like questionable years. Bijan is going to have draft capital. It has incredible talent. And the way that I look at it specifically is if Bijan does not turn out to be 
great, to be the greatest thing since sliced bread, then what he's going to be is a running back, too, that still has good value. And I think going forward, DK Metcalf is probably a, a very high-end wide receiver, too. Maybe a low-end wide receiver, one, without Russell Wilson and, and going forward. You know, he was the wide receiver 18. But there is a world where Bijan is the running back one, is a top three guy. And no matter what, you know he's got, what is it, uh, a four-year age gap? I think it's 21. Uh, Bijan just turned 21, and DK Metcalf is 25. So when I lay all these things out, I think that the reward is worth the risk to take the one-on-one and Bijan Robinson. Okay. Now, where were you before I spoke? And I mean, did I change anything? Because no, I assume you, you were on the Metcalf side. Yeah, I am on the Metcalf side. And you didn't change anything for me. You fool! You fool! Yeah, I mean, he's he, you You pointed it out, the risks. I mean, he, it's not just... Um, you've got later round f running back situations, Sonny Michel, Rashad Penny, that didn't work out the way people hoped. You also have top-end running backs that didn't work out the way you hoped. Trent Richardson is an example of that. Is the probability that he becomes one of those? No. Don't know where he's going. We said on the footcast today it could be a year or two, depending on the destination, until he starts performing. You obviously run an injury risk at that position. Um, and DK Metcalf, I think his ceiling is is top five. I mean, DK Metcalf is that level. If he puts up a 12 to 15 touchdown season combined with what he does in the total receptions, I mean, career high last year, right? I mean, 90 receptions, 140-plus targets with Geno Smith. I think that you you're you're talking about what your team need is. If you are really deep and you want to take a shot at the upside that Jason's talking about, I'm not going to blame you. This is not a situation where I'm like, oh my gosh, you're making a foolish mistake. It's exciting to draft the new hotness. Yeah, um, it's, it's a lot of fun. But yeah. I but I don't think you have to. I mean, I think DK Metcalf is a proven commodity. Bijan is not. Well, yeah, certainly. Um, I am curious. We don't usually... Uh, go to Deucer's Alley on things like this because we have no respect for them. Um, but I I am a little curious the opinions of the people there because I know Brooks has a pretty strong philosophy when it comes to how he does Dynasty. Uh, you know, Kyle Al, where, which side would you take in, in that, Kyle? What's funny is Jeremy and I actually have DK Metcalf. We traded him to Brooks and we'd much rather have the 101 on our team, I, in my opinion. Okay. You traded agreed. DK Metcalf away, though? Yeah, we traded, traded him to Brooks, so it's kind of funny. All of us have had this situation. Oh, I see. Yeah. And Brooks, which side would you be on? Sticking with DK. Yeah, I figured. Yeah. I figured. Um, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, a, uh, it's a tough one. Let me, let me ask you this. Would you trade DK Metcalf for Brees Hall? Absolutely. I would rather have Brees Hall. You would? Yeah. And that's based on what? Just that's based on the fact that I I believe Brees Hall is a top five dynasty rookie running back or d dynasty running back going forward. This is the hardest debate to have because you have both those guys. <laughs> yeah, you have Brees Hall and you have the number one pick for Bijan. Where it's like I, I'm kind of using the point of like obviously the injury was devastating for Brees Hall. He was showing out, um, looked like he was on his way. And at that moment in time, maybe you would have rather had that. But there's just a lot of um, a lot of variables in that picture, and and there's a lot of situations where, you know, who would you rather have, DK Metcalf or Javante Williams? DK Metcalf. The, okay, the, so that, that's one where that would not have been the answer. Oh, for sure. Last year, I mean, it would have been clearly Javante, but the injury and the specific injury he has is that carries a lot of extra risk. So you can't just say, well, he's a couple years younger and he's a talented running back. We don't know how he's going to come back from that injury and how long it'll take a la, uh, you know, uh, J.K. Dobbins. I choose to believe that you simply are optimistic. You you like looking at the rookies and what they could provide for that high-end upside versus looking at it from a perspective of what you might be missing, the Royce Freemans of the world. So a lot of it for me came to taking a 30,000-foot view of the dynasty. That's, too high. That's way too high. A 20,000-foot view. Uh, 10. So I'm in like a little, like an open seat plane. Yeah, like you can breathe. A little prop plane. Yeah, okay. you can breathe. Go All right. On. Well, so I was in a prop plane. I'm looking down at the rookie dynasty running backs, or not just rookies, but dynasty running back position and thinking, okay, how does the top – because we got we got Zeke, we got Dalvin Cook, we've got Derrick Henry, we've got even Austin Eckler. We've got these great running backs who are 
you know, for dynasty purposes, they're starting to age out. And I was like, okay, well, what is the future? How does dynasty football look in the next three or four years? And if you say, okay, where does B. John Robinson slot in right now amongst dynasty rookies at the, or dynasty running backs? It's like, is he, is he not a top five guy right now? Well, I maybe. I don't know. What, what about Najee Harris? He's another example of somebody heralded uh, high expectations. DK Metcalf or Najee Harris right now? I think that's a very fair comp. That I see those two guys very similarly. That would be a position-based thing. The longevity would be on Metcalf's side. So in a vacuum, I would probably take Metcalf. But if I needed, you know, this this specific person, Peter in Rhode Island, was saying he had good young wide receivers. It changes the equation. Wanted to look at running backs. That would be fair. Yeah, no, it makes sense. These are these are the off season discussions that we're going to have. I mean, there are when I think of dynasty running backs, you can start asking questions about players like Ramondre Stevenson, twenty four years old, already a top twelve running back. Which we're getting into the truth at that position, so I'm sure more debates will come up in the next couple weeks. We are. Uh, internally as we work on the dynasty pass for the ultimate draft kit coming up we're launching that on super bowl sunday and the dynasty pass the first version of that will be up on super bowl sunday including dynasty rankings and i think as we workshop around the studio here and and dive deep into our dynasty rookie rankings there's going to be a, a really telling change going from the old guard to the young guard at the top of our rankings. That's that's my current projection, having not sat down and actually uh, hammered that out yet. Yeah, I think it's uh, – Brooks, you said uh, you're a coward with the rookies sometimes. Oh, yeah, definitely. I got burned a couple rookie drafts in a row, and then I've been trading them ever since. Yeah, those, I know. I picks. And I think, I think it's easier for me to be less cowardly about rookies once the draft takes place pre-draft. Yes. It's far more difficult for me to, uh, to see those situations. Because you know every year you're going to have some percentage of them that will be bust. They will, they will be, you know, maybe not Justin Blackman or uh, – uh, what was the other R John Ross? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, maybe not that level, but it's going to happen. I mean, you're going to have players that that are better than you expected or worse. Or um, we went back. Uh, I, I don't know if it was you, Kyle. I think we're we're building out the dynasty pass right now. Which, by the way, everybody out there, the ultimate draft kit presale always starts on Super Bowl Sunday, and if you pre-order it, then you get instant access to the dynasty pass. Which you know, the team is hard at work at building that out. I went back to last year's Dynasty Pass. Mm -hmm. First mock draft. So there's multiple mock drafts. There's multiple releases of the Dynasty Pass research for you to analyze as you begin to make these decisions for your draft. It was a different group. Isaiah Spiller was very, very high in that list. This is the mock draft before the NFL before draft. Before the NFL draft. And that before, changes everything. Well, that, and that's my point is that right now, if that if that statement is true, it changes everything. Then making those trades for draft picks now, where you know the draft changes everything, is a risky business. Not for the faint of heart. Maybe you need to get up at twenty thousand feet, thirty thousand feet, put the mask on to make those calls, and it'll be fun. I and I and I say as we go through this episode, we're going to be talking about the twenty twenty two top ten fantasy finishers at running back. We should add a little dynasty outlook to them because I, I think we'll see these are the best of the best and we're like what does their future multiple years look like then let's do that right now you want answers I think I'm entitled you want answers I want the truth you can't handle the truth once again I get to watch the truth graphic your favorite craft. My okay. favorite because it's it's um, it's definitely not super lazy. I because I, I mean I am wearing some sort of wig right in I my normal that. clothing in this courtroom right. And you, he dressed you up in this drop with nothing. Nothing You're just at all. In but the you do, but you have a wig. I have a wig. Just superimposed on top. Yeah, you don't have a suit on or anything. No, and neither of us are on the stand, and one of us is a judge. <laughs> all right. Top 10 running backs from 2022, episode one for the running back position. High level, the running back scoring was down as a whole in 2022. Fewest running back receiving yards league-wide since 2012, which when I hear that, the first thing I think about is the 
how relevant a player like Jamal Williams was this year. Mm -hmm. Where this is not your prototypical. This is a touchdown dependent, touchdown only type of player. Very relevant. Fewest receiving yards since 2012. The second one here, fewest running back receiving touchdown since 2016. And that's that's a while ago. And what's funny is you would assume we, we went through the truth of the quarterbacks. If you if you haven't heard that, you can go back and listen. And the quarterback scoring was down, and the quarterback passing touchdowns were down. So you'd be like, oh, okay, so more rushing touchdowns were. Nope, there just was a down Neither. down year for scoring. Yeah, which uh, you know, if it's uh, if everybody is, uh, you know, lower if if the water level is lower as a whole, I think maybe we have a bunch of disappointed fancy players possible but yet but but everyone's feeling it right it's not like they're just disappointed and then there's somebody else uh you know there there were breakout players but uh maybe there was some disappointment at the running back position in general this year austin eckler is the rb1 and he has the lowest points per game um the RB one finished what, what? So there. Yeah, explain this to me because I, I think I missed. He, he finished as as the running back one this year with nineteen point one fantasy points per game. Over the last seven years, twenty three running backs have scored more than nineteen point one fantasy points per game. So it shows you kind of how it's almost the, three per year that finished higher than the number one number for this year. Exactly right, and um, I th I think this is part of why we saw a lot of people have success with zero RB this year. And you're going to see that happen, uh, you know, to to pile into next year more because of what happened this year. But overall, over the last decade, running back scoring has actually been trending up. And you might think, well, that's that's surprising since it's a passing game. But that's actually why, because the receiving work of running backs has been going up and up in the NFL, except this year. This year, it it, it didn't really. And so I would just caution people to not see what happened this year as a trend. It, it seems more like the outlier when looking uh, at it from about 15,000 feet. Right, a little bit higher. A little higher, little not higher. too high. Still in the prop plane. Yeah, you, you can't can see you, as how well. How high can you fly you in a prop You can't see as well plane. from there, though, right? No, I can't see anything. I've got big, thick glasses. Yeah. My eyesight's not great. Uh, Jonathan Taylor, Javante Williams, Brees Hall, those were the three major injuries at the running back position. They stayed relatively healthy this year including Mr. Christian McCaffrey. Um, among the top 10 fantasy finishers, uh, they missed one game combined due to injury. That is one of the most unbelievable stats. Um, you know, you look back last year of the top 20 running backs, there were only five guys that, that played 17 games. Um, th that means the top 10 guys, total, all of them combined, one missed game to injury. I think there was... Uh, Derrick Henry was sat for one game, and it, but like this was just a healthy year, so bizarre to have down scoring. Um, all right, so let's get into the truth data. We we've been talking about these thresholds that we are looking at: great games, more than twenty-one points at the running back position; good games, more than uh, eleven points; bust games, fewer than seven points. This is in half PPR scoring. Yeah, and you were pulling your hair out if you got one of those bust games that. You know, you draft a, you spend a high draft capital pick on running backs and you make that investment. And if you don't get what you're expecting, let, let's put it this way. As we start talking about the number one guy, which is Austin Eckler, the reactions are strong and they're strong very quickly. And if you look at how the season started, mm -hmm. that's what you got. Austin Eckler ended up number one. Number three in consistency, so a good number there. And yet, after three weeks, he had finished 28th and 29th in two of the three games, and they were in matchups that you thought were very exploitable. I, we were worried. I, I, I can tell you firsthand, as someone that had both Austin Eckler and Derrick Henry, the first few weeks of the season were terrifying. You thought it was it was done. You know, he, was, he wasn't playing as many snaps, didn't have good, strong fantasy finishes, and, uh, you know, obviously turned things around and became – one of the most consistent running backs the entire rest of the season uh, was great through the fantasy playoffs. Has, I mean, scored, hey, everybody, touchdown regression alert for uh, Austin Eckler last year. Didn't happen. Had another 18. Yeah. I mean, but we're going to, we're gonna, you know, it's going to be said the same thing. Like, he, you can't get 18 touchdowns three years in a row, right? That's just too many for a 200-pound guy. Well, there will be question marks. I mean, 107 receptions last year with Keenan Allen missing games, with Mike Williams missing games. 
and a new offensive coordinator, you don't think people are going to talk about or doubt Austin Eckler after the seemingly underutilization of him at times this year? Well, one thing that was telling when watching the games, you brought this up a lot through the season, I did as well. It seems like they want to give him more rest. They really don't want to overwork him. But the gap between him to the next player on the team was so monumental. It's like when you take him out of the game, you're killing a drive. So there have been, I think the latest mock draft that came out today, had Bijan Robinson going here to the Chargers. I do think that this team needs to go out and get another running back, both for the future and for the present, uh, to give a one-two punch here. So it was a great year for Austin Eckler overall. Still wish they used them more in the playoff game. Maybe they would have held on to win. But uh, 71% good games, 29% great, only 6% bust. So other than a, a bumpy first three games where he had two sub-10-point performances, you were on cruise control with Austin Eckler from that point forward. Even in a couple of games where he was like, you know, you were a little worried about him being banged up and, and, and not being used enough, and then he would just find himself into the end zone. He is a true fantasy football player. Uh, if you're unaware, he's been on our show multiple times, has his own fantasy football show. He cares. And I look, he doesn't get to make the coaching decisions, and everybody wants to score a touchdown when they've got it. But I feel like <laughs> when he's got the ball, he he's like, he knows. He's like, I've got to do – if I don't get in, someone else can get in, get those points away from me on my team. And he doesn't want to let the people you know, down. Yeah. He hasn't. And he's not going to next year either. I th Austin Eckler – has another great season next year because the red zone work that he gets back to back years he's led all running backs and red zone touches tied with Jamal Williams he has more red zone touchdowns the last two years than Derrick Henry and Nick Chubb combined who are seen as like the red zone you know uh, running back touchdown machines and he catches passes so even if they bring someone else in I'm going to be all in on Austin Eckler next year there will be touchdown regression but when you catch as many passes and you're as involved as he is in the red zone enough set I imagine you're taking this next gentleman ahead of Austin Eckler only eight rushing touchdowns this year but 108 targets five receiving Christian McCaffrey at number two in the finish but number one in consistency yeah I mean he, he was absolutely fantastic you know his he had uh really one bad game because one of the games came when he was traded to the San Francisco 49ers and only played like 24% of the snaps. He was unbelievable. That being said, this is the truth episode. We're going to, we got to, we got to deal with hard truths because he was absolutely great. And yeah, he'll probably be the number one pick next year, but there's some data I want to bring up. And I don't know if you know, because I, when I watch these games, I just I keep seeing like, man, Elijah Mitchell's really involved. <clears throat> Is there something to that? And I went back to the game logs, taking out the first game where he played like 20% of the snaps. He played four games with Elijah Mitchell, six games without Elijah Mitchell. Listen to these fantasy. These are how many fantasy points he scored with Elijah Mitchell, 15.7, 14.1. happy that's an average though of 13 fantasy points per game and in those games he played 60 percent of the snaps but without him 36.3 24.6 28.3 22.8 12.8 and 28.8 averaging 25.6 fantasy points per game and playing over 80 percent of the snaps now, I, I presume we all assume that uh, Elijah Mitchell won't be playing 17 games next year because that's kind of his thing. But does that worry you that you're not, you know, the superstar 25.6 fantasy points per game from Christian McCaffrey without Elijah Mitchell is not what we got in the games where Elijah Mitchell was playing and had a couple touchdowns vultured away. And uh, I know. think it's I think it's interesting. I think it's something worth thinking about. I think I think the data set might be not large enough to put doubt in my mind considering management of injuries that we heard throughout a lot of that term, mm -hmm. including even this most recent playoff game where you've got a calf injury. How many years is, or how many weeks has he been dealing with some of these things? So I think uh, I think we know a little bit, right? We know that Kyle Shanahan and this team, they're Super Bowl bound. They have a, a big picture view, about 18,000 to 19,000 foot view right. We're a little of this higher. season. Yeah. 
and they they're they're aiming for a title. So um Shanahan's always been willing to use multiple backs. I think Elijah Mitch is a really good player. That's the problem. But he you is will, because you when will, he wasn't there, the next guy wasn't good enough to say, okay, you get on the field. And and other NFL coaches, maybe take this as a sign. Like, look how good Kyle Shanahan has done. And take this as a sign. If there's a huge gap from your number one to your number two, don't force your number two. Just keep, you know what I mean? Like, to, uh, put Austin Eckler on the field 80%. I don't, yeah. I mean, are you saying that that's enough information that you would actually change where he would go in a draft? Or is this just something to be aware of because maybe the ceiling – that you imagine is better in San Francisco isn't really better than it was in Carolina. It's, it's, it's probably the latter there. Um, it's it's one of those situations where who else is up for the number one spot? Who who else is in that conversation? Is Jonathan Taylor right back in that conversation? He's in that conversation. Um, you know, you're not going to take Derrick Henry ahead of him. Maybe Austin Eckler, but depending on if they add another running back. So there's you, not too many names there. Yeah, no, there's really not. I mean, it, it seems like it's Christian McCaffrey by default. Yeah, it kind of feels that way. Um, people were scared of Christian McCaffrey coming into the year. Ends up with 88% good games. Like you said, maybe one bad game, 35% great, uh, which was a higher number than Austin Eckler, higher percentage of good games than Austin Eckler. You know, when he plays football, he's Christian McCaffrey. They inv I mean, this was a – the pinnacle of the offensive mind minds in the game, with San Francisco – they went out and got this guy that when you didn't think it was possible to go get a player of this caliber, I started thinking about just their progression through this season. Where would they be if they didn't do this trade? How different would the NFL landscape right now look if Buffalo was the team that got them? Because they were in the mix too. If Buffalo added Christian McCaffrey, are they right now playing at a neutral site? I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, No, right. but that's, that's kind of what I was thinking about. It's like Elijah Mitchell, he's back now, but he wasn't back. You know, what's the landscape look like? It would be. So for, for dynasty purposes, is Christian McCaffrey your one-on-one? Yes. For, uh, at, at least as a running back. Not not one-on-one because I would certainly take some of the young stud wide receivers out of him. But uh, for running backs, is, is he the number one running back? Yes. Has a nice big contract, even though he's a little older. He's just unbelievable. The, true, the truth about Christian McCaffrey is he's unbelievable. What's the, he's 26 years old. How old is Derrick Henry? 29. Okay. Give me three years of Christian McCaffrey. He's my number one. Yeah. If you give me three years. Uh, and, he, and he catches passes, right? So there's this um, – I think the cliff is not going to be – it's going to be a slow hill down probably. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Josh Jacobs finished at number three. What a season for Josh Jacobs. His, consens his consistency rank was seven, 65% good, 24% great, 18% bust. Beat up on bad teams, uh, over 20 fantasy points per game. It was a weird year. I don't think we knew what to expect. It's going to be weird going forward. This is a fourth-round pick. Yeah, I mean. By he, far the best value. He won the award for running back of the year in the footies because of where you drafted him, the value he represented, and how good he was. He had a couple of weeks where he just, you know, 32 fantasy points, 35 fantasy points, 45 fantasy points. They were beyond weak winning weeks. They were weak winning weeks that also gave you points for tiebreakers to get you in the playoffs. And he started really slow to start the year. You know, it, it looked like the fourth round value in fantasy drafts were correct. Yeah, just what you expected. But then they were like, wow, the gap between the number one and the number two running back on our team is the Grand Canyon. And so they just started playing Josh Jacobs, giving him everything. His workload was outrageous. And he was obviously he didn't have his fifth year contract picked up. So he's a free agent. We don't know where he's going, if he's going to resign uh, with the Raiders or not go after the bag on the open market. He certainly deserves it after what he did this season. What did he tweet out? Because this that's our number one source for player uh, contract disputes. I think he tweeted something out recently, like, it's got to work for me, something like that. Kyle's looking that it's up. very I mean, important I mean, information. Look, Josh, go get the bag. You're running back. Get the biggest payday you can. Go wherever is going to pay you the most. And I'll, I, I want to be clear here. Like, we were wrong about Josh Jacobs. Yeah. Well, when you say we, you mean everybody but Brooks. Yeah. Because Brooks did chime in true. and was always supportive of Josh Jacobs. And so – yeah, I mean, that. if you were reading the offseason, we misread it. I mean, Zamir yeah. White was somebody that you thought they 
will come in and have a role. Josh McDaniels with Brandon Bolden. It looked, and then not picking up the fifth year option. It and looked then like playing a, him in the Hall of Fame game know, into the like third quarter. Yeah, but I just I don't want to give like all all the kind of like it was just a wrong call. It I mean, a, it would have been a great one to to get right. Yeah, no, we were one hundred percent wrong on Josh Jacobs, and he was uh you know one of those more rare examples, but does happen of the quote unquote dead zone running back in those rounds like four through seven that do come through for fantasy football. So if you believe in a player's talent, even if some of the things around them is pushing them down in a draft, call your shot. Uh, you know, because no, I don't think any of us here thought Josh Jacobs was a bad running back. I don't think I thought he was this good. Like he was, he was legitimately, he, he deserves to be thought of as maybe the best running. I mean, he's the, he's the rushing uh, title yeah. winner. And he looked it. He looked awesome every time he got the ball, yards after contact, just had a brilliant season. And so there is the possibility. We know Derek Carr won't be there. And if they choose to pay to bring Josh Jacobs back, there's a chance that they, that Tom Brady is a Las Vegas Raider, that Jimmy Garoppolo is a Raider. And so this might be one of those things where Jacobs has, let me put it this way, has he played well enough for long enough to where you don't care who's going in there at quarterback. You'll just play Jacobs as a top-tier option. Yes, if he is a Raider. That's what I mean. Yes. If he's a Raider, you don't care about the quarterback because you'll know he's coming back to do what he's done. I will I will 100% be in on Josh Jacobs as what he was this year to continue that next year if he is a Raider. 1,653 yards rushing, 53 receptions, which is nice. I mean – to have on top of that, uh, that's the fifth most rushing yards over the last decade. It was the RB1 from week nine on, and um, it was awesome. I mean, it was a, a really – he was one of those players where a lot of championship teams had Josh Jacobs because where you got him, it was it was a free week winner. Yes. All right, let's take a quick break, and we'll uh, we'll jump into some very big shoes. All right. <laughs> Look at us in these humongous shoes. Derrick Henry comes in at number four. He was actually number two in consistency. If you would like to know why Jason Moore won a championship in our league of record, he has the number one and number two most consistent running backs, according to our truth metrics. Yeah, it's a pretty good year, um, which, which ironically, both of those players, the number one and number two, had – rough starts to the season the first couple of weeks it looked like they were done but the Tennessee Derrick Henry's really got going I mean they he had 39.6 percent of Tennessee's team yards and touchdowns uh, that's the number one in the NFL that's the highest of his career he was everything to this offense. They obviously had a, a few games where Ryan Tannehill didn't play he was even more everything there's going to be concerns about age. There's going to be concerns about workload. And there's going to be concerns about the offense as a whole. Yeah, new new offensive coordinator coming in. New offensive coordinator. I, I, I presume, based on the contract situation, how this year played out, that it will be Ryan Tannehill. If they can't, like, trade for an Aaron Rodgers or someone, I don't think they're drafting a, a, a rookie. So, um, if, you throw age, if you throw age out, let's just pretend he doesn't age. Which, okay? yeah, I'm fine with that. If you, because because so far he hasn't. We don't know how yet he's yeah. aged. Yeah, like the dog years, it could be the reverse where mm -hmm. it's like he's twelve years old right now. <laughs> we, I mean, he could be twelve years old. And you telling me you don't want a twelve year old running back that's this good already? So if you throw age out, this team I think will be a lot better next year. I really I do. Agree. If you, I don't remember the exact numbers, but this has like been the most injured football team for two straight years. Their offensive line was extremely injured. Obviously, they lost Taylor Lewan for most of the year. Uh, just they, they they replaced A.J. Brown with Traylon Burks, who missed most of the year. It's not going to be worse as an offense in Tennessee next year as far as personnel going into the season. The only thing that will change my opinion on Derrick Henry next year, it's not going to be age. It will be if they make a high draft capital investment on another running back. Sure. To plan for the future. But Derrick Henry, 
41 targets, 33 catches, 1,500 yards, 13 rushing touchdowns, uh, beat up bad defenses despite the offensive line being ranked 32nd in the league, and it was special. 75% good games, 44% great. A few more duds than we were used to seeing, but they were up against it. Quarterback, you know, was changing all the time. Yeah, I mean, it was certainly unfortunate what happened at the end of the year, missing championship week in week 17 um, because of nothing to do with football, but the you know the way the schedule worked out, Tennessee didn't need uh, that game to matter, so they rested him, and he was still phenomenal. 6% bust rate is a great number. Um, he never really, really let you down on a, on a regular basis. What he did the previous season was disrespected because of his age. What he did this season will be disrespected because of his age. Everyone wants to call their shot when it's over, and here's the and truth. it will be over someday. When it's over, it's over. You fall off a cliff, and it's a worthless pick. It's the reason why I didn't draft any Adam Thielen this year because you know you're getting to the cliff. You don't want to be holding the bag when you're at the cliff. I will be drafting Derrick Henry. There are a few people that are outlier human beings. Yetis. There are a few there, yetis. There are a few that are outlier yetis, and I'm going to keep taking the shot on those players, and I will hold the bag when it runs out. There you go. So uh, Nick Chubb is the opposite of Eckler and Henry. He was the most dominant running back in the first half of the season. His consistency rake on the year, and I barely got through that word right there. Yeah, well, consistency? Yeah, I was going to say I don't think you did. But. Okay. Well, I shouldn't have drawn any attention to it. You were probably would have let me go. I, would, I was being kind. Uh, his consistency rank? Yes, go on. Was six on the year, but number two in the first half of the season. Number He's one, number so nine, number 11, number six. Uh, another player that you kind of looked at and you said, well, okay. Nick Chubb was a lot like Josh Jacobs in the sense that whatever was going on around him, he was just Nick Chubb. He's just one of the best running backs in football. 1,500 more rushing yards this year never catches a lot of passes so he never finishes at the tippy top of the position but i mean weeks yeah, I one mean, through eight this was the very best running back in football it's almost like something changed in cleveland it's almost like you know when they were scoring 23.9 points per game as a team 11th in the nfl and then the last six weeks something changed where they they just couldn't score the ball a lot. You know, they they dropped down to 16 total points per game. Uh, so that affected Nick Chubb. He went from 94 rushing yards a game to 81. Uh, didn't score touchdowns as much because the opportunities weren't there and seven fewer fancy points you per game. You're talking about Voldemort. I am talking about Voldemort. When uh, Voldemort took over at quarterback, this offense struggled. Deshaun Watson sucked this year. Now, we we – we threw up all those red flags. We talked about he hasn't played in a year and a half. He didn't get to practice with the team. It wasn't like he wasn't just playing, but he was in the facilities. He's been gone from the game. I think if you're looking at next year, you have to ask yourself, what do you believe about Deshaun Watson? Is is he get the whole offseason, the OTAs, the training camps, the uh, preseason, and he's going to be ready to go? Or is this more of a Tiger Woods situation where he's going to come back and never be the same as he was before? Where do you stand? I stand there. I, I don't think he gets back to being one of the best three quarterbacks in real life or in the NFL, and he, I think he's probably going to be a middling running back, which Wait, will have a real life or the NFL. Yeah, I did say that because same, real right? life to me is fantasy. Okay. Okay. Right, when I right. say real life I on this like show, that a little bit. That's pretty good. <laughs> that's fantasy football. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, fantasy football is real life. That's right. Real life is fantasy. That's right. Got and, it. And then, and then NFL is like, you know, National Football League. So, what happens there? So I don't. I, if you set the bar at number three, I don't think he gets the to that point. Six. I think he could do that. Yeah. You think he can do that? Sure. That's a cop out. Do you think he will <laughs> be a top six quarterback? Uh, in this current landscape, no. Not with the other talents I think are out there. But I think he'll be top ten. And that that's a bar he didn't come close to reaching this year. And I think that's a, enough for the offense to get moving. I mean, if you played Nick Chubb at the back half of the year, you would look at the box score and you'd be like, oh, he's running for like a nice yards per carry. Oh, he's getting a bunch of carries. And then you'd be like, why is he the number 29 or the number 32 or the number 23 running back this week? 
It's because he wasn't getting anywhere near the painted area. Mm -hmm. They couldn't get the ball down there to give it to him. Now, I do think it will be better than the putrid final six games for the Clevelands, for the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> but I... You, for the Grover Cleveland. Right. Yes. But I don't believe that they will be good enough to make Nick Chubb a great running back because he does need touchdowns since he doesn't catch the ball. So Nick Chubb, 27 years old, has one more year of big money left on his three-year contract that he signed. Dynasty outlook, Nick Chubb. Would you trade Nick? I mean, you couldn't trade Nick Chubb for the 101 right now, right? How old is he? 27. Nick Chubb dynasty outlook is a little sketch, but he's really good. I think it, it, it's a, there's a strong argument that he's the best pair runner in the game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, every play that you watch, you go, he picks up incredible yards after contact. He's fast. He's strong. They should give him the ball more. If if a situation like Tennessee with, with Derrick Henry didn't exist, we would use Nick Chubb and the and the Browns as the example of he's your offense. So I think I think I think you'll be all right for a little while, even if he ends up somewhere else. Okay. Uh, two years left on the deal. So they can get out in twenty twenty four. So these last two running backs, Derrick Henry, Nick Chubb, very similar, a little bit older. Would you rather have Bajon Robinson than both of them in Dynasty? I think so. Yeah. You, you, I, I, you did it. I'm just saying he just keep when you look at the right, he just keeps climbing up, not just because of his potential, but because of but that, the aging out of the great running back. Well, just like our discussion earlier, though, which got qualified by this gentleman writing in and saying, hey, I've got I've got plenty of wide receivers and I need a running back. Would you trade DK Metcalf for one? I'm qualifying that answer by am I one of the three juggernaut teams in my league that's about to win a title? Because I would rather play Derrick Henry next year than B. John Robinson, unless we find out a destination that changes that. And I'd rather play Nick Chubb next year than B. John Robinson. Because my odds of winning a title are the the odds are higher with the established than the unestablished. Certainly before the NFL draft. Too before, much, too at much least unknown. before the NFL draft, yeah. Um but yeah, I mean, we were we could talk about Bijan all day. I could because we and were, you know, where the best destinations for him will be, where he could get a lot of work early, where he's the goal line back and it's not a rushing quarterback. That's the centerpiece. You know, we talked about okay, you end up in Buffalo, you end up in Philly, that could be great. Yeah, good offenses, but a you, lot of opportunity. But, but you, when you want to be number one, you got it. You got to have the whole plate. You get we we talked about this. You <laughs> Philadelphia, the Eagles. You get on the one yard line. That is not a running back touchdown ever, ever, no. because you have a guaranteed touchdown with the yep. quarterback sneak. Yeah. So uh, you need to come up with your 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 rooting five. Okay. okay. Your five Bijan destinations. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll sort. And mine. then and then if they you got to do something special if he goes to one of those five. Just not the Lions. That's all I ask. Oh my. Goodness. And with their extra pick of the first round, if he goes to Detroit, I'm worried. if he goes to Detroit, it might be the greatest day of my life. Because, because I because you hate me. No, I don't hate you. <laughs> I enjoy watching you react to things. Yeah, and the 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 it's like you know when you think they're done with a great ser movie series, <laughs> and you're like, man, those were great. I know they're never going to make another one. And then they make another one, and I'm front row in the theater. I've got the tickets. Yeah. I mean, I didn't. <laughs> Don't do it, Detroit. Build I that mean... defense. Build that defense of the draft. On, oh, don't do that. On, That's doing me dirty. Carry on, Johnson. You know what's I funny? I want to see the next movie. Carry on, Johnson affects me in so many different ways. Like, I'm watching tape, and like. I'm Wait, you're just af afraid of the next I, carry on? Absolutely. I'm watching. Uh, is it uh, Bigsby's? Uh, Auburn, right? Tank Bigsby. Yeah, yeah. so I'm watching Tank Bigsby. It's, I'm like, it's actually I, Eleanor, but go I, on. <laughs> I, I, I like him, and I'm like, oh, this better not be an Auburn <laughs> trick. These A lot of these wildcat running back formations. Oh, no. Yeah. Carry on. Well, that's, uh, that's uh, fantasy PTSD. Yes, it is. All right, at six, Saquon Barkley, who's the number three in consistency over the first half of the year, 10 in the second half, five on the year. Uh, it was a bounce back season. He was amazing for the first eight weeks. A few bumps and bruises over the second half of the year, but not physically, which has been the key, right? 
75% good games, 19% great. The offensive line wasn't great, but Saquon is going to get paid. Yeah. I believe his comment was something like, I don't think I've played the last down in a Giants uniform. So the, the he, he said he's not interested in resetting the running back market, that he's realistic with his situation. It seems like he does want to return to the Giants. I think he'll be back. I think he'll I think be back as well. Jones but be Daniel Jones is the big question mark. I don't think Daniel Jones is back because they're not going to franchise him. He's too, That would be too much money. And I don't think they want to give him a big contract. They've seen him long enough, and they've kind of seen the, the peak. And based on what Daniel Jones they, did. Not they, though. They as an organization. Barely. I mean, Gettleman's gone, and you have – you have you have a good playoff season. I think he'll be back. That would be my vote. There betting, is, betting. Odds. He's going to be. Let's say they don't franchise him. That means he's a free agent, right? And if he tests the market, there could be a team out there that says, "Hey, Daniel Jones is going to come in and take us to the playoffs." Let, let me put it this way: the league has seen him as much as the Giants have seen him. Okay. Right. I yeah. mean, they, everybody's watched Daniel Jones. Nobody knows what the heck he is. Well, let's talk about what Saquon Barkley is, which is a very, very talented running back who dominated the first half of the season. Had yeah, does Daniel Jones being back make any difference to you for Saquon? I mean, is there any situation where – it's not like Daniel Jones was – No, I If mean, anything, he was hurting him around the goal line and with the rushing yardage. Yeah, obviously, who comes in instead of Daniel Jones is a big question mark. It's always Carson Wentz. If, if, if probably, it's always Carson Wentz. He's the last guy that just like... There's seven or eight of them out there. Carson Wentz it's, is. It's literally musical chairs. And he's like, oh, that's the last one left. All right, give me Carson Wentz. It's Matt Ryan. Oh, Matt Ryan's done. Uh, same number of touches for Saquon this past year as his best fantasy season. It was nice. It was a good season for Saquon. He, you knew right away, too, that if you had taken that shot in the late second, mid-second, you won. You won the prize. He comes out week one, has the number one fantasy finish that week, and looked awesome uh, in route. So, yeah, you, you knew he was great. I do think second half of the year, people were very disappointed. And I think they were disappointed in part just because of how good the first half of the year was. And they were hoping they had, you know, the Austin Eckler consistency but he did have some duds along the way in the playoff weeks and and leading up to it that were I can't, rather disappointing. I can't really explain them either. It does. It they never made sense to me. The Detroit one was the huge one. That was the, you know, I think we were surprised it was that bad against Detroit, even though they were being better. But then Philadelphia, okay, you can explain that away a little bit. Week seventeen, championship week, Colts defense shut him down. It, it seemed like the team just avoided him sometimes. Yeah, it it, it is uh, certainly weird when um when he went away, and you hate to see that, especially from someone who's a pass catcher, because usually that is what's going to allow you to be consistent in a bad game script. But next year, Saquon Barkley, who will turn twenty six years old, assuming he is a New York Giant again, I think he's probably going to be drafted in the top five picks. He'll be up the you know. You're going to. Are you taking Eckler over Saquon? I will take Eckler over Saquon, assuming they don't go out and get another. You know, if they draft Bijan, then flip floppy. Obviously, obviously. Yeah. Tony Pollard was number seven. Zeke was nineteen. So we'll handle them in tandem here. Pollard ended up eleven in consistency rank. Mm -hmm. Zeke, this is the shocking part. Zeke ended up at eight. Yes, in consistency. Zeke had more a higher percentage of his games as good games than Pollard did, but he had no great games. Yeah, and Pollard had 20% of his games, those weak winning type of performances where he finished one, two, six, seven, three at the position. Zeke's highest fantasy finish on any week was eight. Right, but his, his low was rare. And this metric that we have for kind of our, our true score about um, how a players did takes out injuries. So obviously if you had Zeke, you felt that middle of the season when you lost him. And, you know, it was part of the plan we kept talking about on this show, how the schedule is going to be really nice for Zeke down the stretch. And then right when that was supposed to come to fruition, he was gone. And um, that was, you know, that, that hurt fantasy managers. It hurt their playoff chances. But when you go back to the game log and you look at what Ezekiel Elliott did, he was really solid. It surprised me going through the numbers to see, man, 
He got the job done. He was a touchdown machine, and he's playing on a great offense, and they're going to keep using him as you know a, a goal line back. He's not going to be drafted higher. He'll be drafted lower next year than he was this year, and he was a third-round pick. So I don't think he has the upside potential that he ever, that, you know, that he once had. He, no, no matter, he definitely doesn't. No I mean, matter, he, yeah, he, the door is closing. It might be closing slowly. What's a little weird to me when you look at the numbers for Pollard and Zeke is that this was the backfield where when you sat here on the show and you previewed games each week, if you said this is a great week for Dallas's backfield to run the football, it was. Like if they played a bad defense, you know, they were great. Both players were great. Zeke was 15.6 fantasy points per game against bad defenses. Pollard was 17.79. When they played a great defense, they were under 10 points. Like, it was a huge disparity for both backs. I mean, it was massive. So, you know, you could come here and be like, oh, man, I'm going to go with – I don't know which Cowboy to go with on these bad matchups, and it would both of them would be fine. Yeah. Now, obviously, we're talking about Tony Pollard, got injured in the playoffs, will be uh, back by week one, but what team we do not know yet. Dallas. I do think I, – I, I think the injury makes it more likely he's back in Dallas. Yeah, I just think uh, I think Zeke will take a pay cut. He said he will, and I think that will enable the team to, you know, maybe it's a shorter deal for Pollard because he wants to cash in again. I don't, I don't know. Because of what Tony Pollard did, if Tony Pollard is back in Dallas, Tony Pollard will be drafted ahead of Zeke. Right, he finished ahead oh, of yeah. him this oh, yeah. year, and because of that, I, I, I'm just curious how far Zeke is going to fall in drafts. He looks to me to be the player that no one will want to touch under any circumstance. He's the backup. He's a year older. And even though we talk about, well, he was actually pretty good this year, his his truth metric was good. He wasn't good. He let people down, and people felt like it was a dud because he started the year slow and got injured in the middle of the year. But when he was out there playing, he was actually pretty good. So, you know, could he fall to, like, the sixth round? No. No, not not as I don't think the sixth round. I guess you're going to see maybe more, fourth or fifth more what happened like with Josh Jacobs. Yeah, fourth round probably, especially with what you said. If Tony Pollard's injury makes any headlines in training camp, if he's slower to get back, if he takes the pay cut, I don't know. the The landscape has changed. Dallas is not a one headed monster anymore. No, the Lions aren't either. Jamal Williams finished at eight. DeAndre Swift at 22. Jamal Williams was eighth in total fantasy finish with 17 touchdowns. An incredible 16 targets. Uh, he basically didn't catch the football. So his consistency rank, that truth metric, it's at 20. Uh, he had 35% bust games. Yeah, I mean, if you're not, if you're so touchdown dependent, I know he scored a ton of touchdowns, but if that's all you do, which is pretty much all he did most of the season, then you're going to be inconsistent. You're going to bust a lot, and the truth is not as good. You know, Jamal Williams finishes the running back eight. He did not help you in fantasy as much. Now, he was he helpful. He helped you like a running back two or three. Yes, he was helpful because of where he was drafted. You know, our truth metric doesn't, like, factor in uh, draft value or even waiver wire value in, in Jamal Williams. In some leagues, he, he could have been found on the wire. Um he Going. was outside the top 36 six different times. He was probably the most annoying player for fantasy managers to play against if you drew the short straw and got one of the weeks where he finished at two or five or nine or four or four or three. If he got in the end zone, you were like, oh, my gosh, why did I get that week from Jamal? Well, and if he got in the end zone, a lot of times he did that again. He was like, yeah, oh, yep. come on. Um, yeah, it's going like forward. Kit Kat. He needs a double. Going forward, uh, Lions, please re-sign him immediately. Do not look towards the draft. Um, that's all I'm saying. Now, the other tandem teammate here, DeAndre Swift, think this is what people are like, oh, why isn't Mike here today? He didn't want to talk about DeAndre Swift. Yeah, he, he asked. Uh, he got a doctor's note. He, he said, uh, is DeAndre Swift going to be brought up on this episode? We're like, yeah, probably bring, it, bring up his name. I'm out, he said. Yep. I hate DeAndre Swift. I won't be here. That's right, and uh, and then we said, you know, we got a guy. We got a guy that can come in here and talk to DeAndre Swift. <laughs> um, and I'll step up and, and be that man, but uh, the running back 22, DeAndre Swift, 
super disappointing as a high end second round. He was on like that one two turn, the running back nine, and then what he did weeks one and two said we were right. He is the next greatest thing. He was the running back three, the running back four, got injured. Oh man. And you just thought when he comes back, he's going to be something outrageously special like he was those first two weeks. Is that Never. what Mike, Mike thought when he went and traded for him? Absolutely. When, that's Ky what, when Kyle went and traded for him? That's what I thought when they traded for him. When they traded in our league of record for DeAndre Swift, I was so bummed out because the fact that you were able to get what looked like a top five running back rest of season, uh, what looked like could be the number one running back the rest of season, and then when he came back, my goodness, the Lions didn't want to use him or he wasn't healthy or whatever it was. He didn't get the goal line opportunities. Those are Jamal Williams. He had some, but you had the most frustrating experience with DeAndre Swift. I, I feel here's, like here's my worry. Is he on the Antonio Gibson plan? Because there, look, the excitement for Antonio Gibson by some in the fantasy world was extremely high. The next Christian McCaffrey. And then you hit a wall at some point in time when everybody saw it and they said, it's not happening. Are you there with DeAndre Swift where you think, for whatever reason, injuries combined with... Yeah, it's not happening. Okay. It's the curse. It's the curse. The Lions it's the curse. Barry Sanders curse. The only way that you can be good as a running back is if you're not supposed to be. Jamal Williams. When you're <laughs> supposed to be great, carry on, DeAndre Swift, not going to happen. That's why Bijan can't go there. When he came back from uh, from his injury, what's what's so crazy is to think that he missed only three games this year. I feel like he missed who is, uh, half of the season. Who is the other running back that I'm thinking of? Oh, Amir Abdullah. Nope. I'm not even thinking of him. One more beyond Amir Javid Abdullah. Javid Best. Javid Best. Oh, yeah. That is who I was thinking of. So if your name's Joyk Bell or Jamal Williams, you're good? Yes, exactly. If you're if you're supposed to not be good and you play a tuba and you're just you can you can be all right for fantasy, but um in all seriousness, I'm I'm out on so Swift. Dynasty wise. Dynasty wise, if I had you're him freaking. I think that there are plenty of people still in on DeAndre Swift. And the real question is whether Al is in or out on DeAndre Swift because he, I believe, is a Swift dynasty. He's a Swifty. He's, He's a, a Swifty, Swifty for sure. Would you trade DeAndre Swift for similar value if you could, or are you holding on in the hopes that he uh, goes to great value? Would you trade him for Dalvin Cook at this age? I, yeah, probably. We we were actively trying to shop Swift, but we didn't get anywhere. Okay. For the record, I would I would take Swift over Dalvin in Dynasty. Feeling a lot of negative energy about Dalvin in Dynasty. We're going to talk about him in a second. Yeah. The more I think about it, our team we're in a full rebuild, so I would probably not go for the age of Dalvin. But yeah, I guess in your situation that makes sense. Would you trade him for AJ Dillon? No, you wouldn't. Do no. That. no. All right, Aaron Jones at number nine, AJ Dillon at twenty five. And, uh, I mean, it doesn't get much more rough for A.J. Dillon than the first half of the year. Aaron Jones ends up at 9, consistency of 17. Welcome to the Aaron Jones experience. 18% great games. So, I mean, he had quite so, a few, six different top 10 performances. 30 points, 30 points, 27 points. I mean, he, he's, he has huge games. Fewest rushing touchdowns, two by a top 10 fantasy running back since Darren Sproles in 2011. So you talk about two touchdowns on the ground for Aaron Jones. That's not, you know, that's not normal. No, I mean, you you had a bad offense. You genuinely had a Packers team that was supposed to be one of the primary contenders in the NFC that just didn't score enough points. And you could blame it on whatever you want, the fact that they didn't, uh, you know, the fact that they sent away Devontae Adams or didn't use high enough draft capital or the, the draft capital they did use on Christian Watson was injured. Whatever excuses you want to give, they had a bad offense, and it's very difficult for running backs to have good fantasy value when your offense doesn't score enough. 13 fewer touchdowns for the Packers this year than last year. And A.J. Dillon, it didn't come to fruition because this offense, again, A.J. Dillon's, 
the story of A.J. Dillon was supposed to be predicated on contention for the division and being in the red zone. Yeah. And giving him the football and, and rebuilding this identity on the ground, but succeeding at it and, and moving the ball down the field and, and giving him more opportunities. Now, you did see some good performances from Dillon in the second half of the year. Yeah, I mean, you saw the flashes that, that made us like A.J. Dillon. I would say, like Josh Jacobs, this is another place where we got it wrong. And where we got it wrong was the offense as a whole. Maybe the the impact that Devontae Adams leaving would have had. I mean, you had the back-to-back -back NFL MVP in Aaron Rodgers, who had not looked like he slowed down at all. And now it, it feels totally different in hindsight looking back on the season. But I think that was the story of the Packers running backs. They they just didn't have a good enough offense for two guys splitting a workload to be consistent in any any way that's good enough to help your fantasy team. Yep. The little the little stretch we saw of AJ Dillon from week twelve through seventeen, he scored every week, you know, and had six touchdowns in five weeks. And that was what you were hoping to get more of. But he was basically unplayable before that. And so you probably, if you drafted him and thought he was a flex, thought he was an RB3, he wasn't. And Aaron Jones really made it hard on you as well. Yeah, his consistency was a little bit all over the place. Like we said, big blow-up games, but had a lot of meh games that just weren't good enough to be valuable. In dynasty purposes, he's going into his age 29 season. So you're getting to the scary years. Is B. John Robinson going to be a top seven redraft running back? Depends on landing spot, obviously. If he goes to Tennessee or you know the Chargers, probably not. But if he goes to a spot in the first round with a team that's dedicated to giving him the ball, yeah, he'll probably be very high in redraft, and I'll bet he pays off that value. Which is why well, I'm when, saying in Dynasty, it, it it just seems like he's the future of this position, along with like uh, well, Brees, and, uh, Brees and Jonathan Taylor, and uh, you know some of the young guys. There's just not a whole bunch of them. So uh, closing it out, Dalvin Cook at number ten. 53% good games, 24% great games. That's a nice number, right? Yeah. He had some really big games this season. He was very good the first half of the year. 24% bust. He was number six in our consistency metric over the first half of the year. But the second half of the year, he was 29th. And at first, I really wanted to That's make it. That's a no good. I wanted to make it not his fault at all. Excuse it away. I'd watch a run and I'd say, man, he looks fast. He looks great. But when I look at some of the efficiency numbers on what he produced versus what was he was expected to produce, he was among the worst. And that just is kind of shocking. That How do you explain a game like the Indianapolis game where they made that comeback in his – he still has elite plays. Right. But then doesn't have elite play throughout the duration of a game. It's not his team. Justin Jefferson has taken over. This is a passing team. And he is a talented running back who's getting older and less important to the offense. So going forward, he's going to be older and less important to the offense. Is this a product, do you think, of the the new offensive system not working to his strengths in the running game where he, you know, he had the most rush attempts gaining zero or negative yards, obviously changing from what he was used to to Kevin O'Connell's system? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's something. Could really he have not just been the fit that they thought? Yeah, I mean, it's really important to factor that in. He he still had plenty of long breakaway runs. You look at the season, a 30-yard run, a 40-yard run, an 81-yard run. So once he got it going, he was good. But I think the system on a normal run-by-run-by-run run run basis didn't fit him quite as well as, you know, the, the Koobs the Koobs system. So you can argue, oh, well, another year in the system, he'll be better and should be great next year. You can argue he's a year older. You have him on one of your most important teams. You watched him with a close eye. You just said you're getting a little bit worried. Are you know? Are you I, moving I feel him like down there's a, a lot of redraft? negativity around him. Yeah, in redraft, I think I would. I think in dynasty, certainly. I mean, a player of his age has to go down. It's just, are, am I going to go down with him? Because running backs are hard to come by. Mm -hmm. Like all this negative, oh, all this negativity. This is the number 10 running back. He's on this show. He's not on next show. Right. Right? So it's hard when when you're saying, what am I getting for Dalvin Cook? It's not like the other people in your league aren't going to identify his age in a dynasty league. So maybe the name would make it compelling enough. Like I had made a trade in another dynasty league acquiring Ramondre. I'd rather have Ramondre in a dynasty league than Dalvin Cook. No question. 
But um, if he do, if they don't add another big body to the backfield, a big body to the backfield. Mm-hmm. A BBB. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If they don't add a name that is impressive like or a high draft capital pick and they just bring in a – a nobody to be the Madison next year. Yeah, I was gonna say they're gonna lose Alexander Madison. Yeah. And, and if they use uh, who's the uh, the rookie? Um, Ty Chandler. Ty Chandler. If they just lean on him and a mixture of uh, is it Nwangu? Uh, if they just go that direction, yeah, how do you, he, I mean, Dalvin Cook's gonna be part of a, a he, what was it thirteen of fourteen? Their main running back. You just talked about being on winning teams. Yeah, and I mean, through those first 10 weeks, he was the running back nine, like we said, playing very well. I'm not sure what happened at the end of the season. You worry when a guy is a little bit older and he starts sucking at the end of the year, but um, <laughs> that's... Uh, that, I worry about that, yeah. That, I mean, that can happen. Yeah, that can. All right, that'll do it for today's episode of the Fantasy Footballers. Back with another Running Back Truth show very soon. Hopefully you enjoyed this one. Let us know on Twitter at the FF Ballers. Talk to you later. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.